much. <coughs> I'm uh, here to convince the five of you in the audience that aren't actually on Facebook that the whole thing is completely overrated and all your prejudices were correct. <laughs> <coughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> there are lots of us not on Facebook. Okay. I don't know what the rest of you are going to do for the next 14 minutes, but <coughs> uh, I guess uh, at some level, I mean, this has happened before with email, I think, back in the early, late 80s, early 90s, and that kind of thing. But when, particularly when Facebook came on stream, I think there was a kind of um, promissory note made on the tin can by the, the techies that created it, which said, this is going to open you up to the global village. You're going to have hundreds of thousands of friends and all over the world. And the real question is, is that so? Uh, the short answer is uh, no. <laughs> Despite the fact that Facebook allows you to put 5,000 friends up on, on the can, as it were, uh, in fact, most people don't. And if, um, as a result of sort of this uh, discussion about who, who, who your friends are on, on Facebook, Facebook actually started to look at their own data and when they did an analysis of the entire whatever it is, 400 million Facebook users, and looked at all the numbers of friends people had, uh, the average was actually about 150. The modal value, the most common value, is somewhere between 120 and 130, which I think is about right, because you've got to leave a little room before the 150 uh, for granny, who's sort of not really online yet, and, and you need you know, a few odd people like that. Um, but the key to the, the issue is really even though you sign up and can sign up lots and lots of people, uh, in fact, you spend most of your time talking to only a very few of them. These are Facebook's own data here, and they're looking at the number of people just measured in different ways you have, you know, sort of traffic with that you're talking to. And it's sort of divided up between those who have only about 50 friends, 150 friends, and 500 friends. And although the number of friends listed is increasing by an order of magnitude, by a factor of 10, the number of close friends, if you like, that most of your so time on Facebook is spent talking to is actually quite small. It's only somewhere between three and, three, three and um, uh, uh, about 10 or so. And the reason for that is there appears to be a cognitive limit on the number of individuals we can keep in, in a sort of relationship with us. And this comes off the back of work we were doing on the size of social groups in monkeys and apes. And, and these are the key data here. This is average group size in different species of monkeys and different species of apes. These are chimpanzees, gorillas, uh, uh, gibbons, as it happens, against a measure of brain size. And you can see, particularly for the apes, this is a very clear line. This, uh, this block here turns out to be three separate grades, rather tightly defined grades, a, a bit like this. But the key thing is if you plug humans into this regression equation, and, and the human brain data are from the same uh, data set as all the primate data, we get a predicted value off the great ape equation of about 150. That's what's now known as Dunbar's number. Ironically, it was so christened on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and if you were the person who did that, and you're here today, thank you very much for making my career. <laughs> is this really true that that's the size of our group? The answer is yes. I mean, here's a bunch of casual uh, examples of human organizations that have that sort of size, somewhere between 100 and 200. Um, and these are our attempts, really, to look at real human relationships, if you like, in this context. These, these are the census sizes for hunter-gatherer groups. And so hunter, all human societies are multi-layered. So these are a sort of series of grouping layers, community layers you've got. And it's this one here, the red dots, which are the key. They're, they're all the same type of cluster of community, and they cluster very nicely around the value of 150, which is the blue line, and the red, the red dotted lines are the uh, confidence intervals around that. So they all fit really quite nicely within it. And this was our attempt, first, very first attempt to look at what it meant for you as an individual. And we asked people to tell us who they were sending Christmas cards to, not the number of cards they were sending, but who were in the household, the total number of people in the household. And that turns out to be very close to 150. The average in this data set was 154. There's a lot of variability around that. Some of us are incredibly mean and don't send any cards at all. Uh, some people send them to their butcher and their baker and their lawyer and you know all those kind of important people. But the key is that it's you know, nicely 
peaked here around 150. It turns out that the reason for that is it's a problem with your brain. And we've been able to show with uh, neuroimaging studies and a series of neuroimaging studies, and these have now been replicated by other people, so the effect really is quite robust, is that the number of friends you have is essentially a function of the size of this bit of the brain up here, right above the eyes. That's the bit that's hugely important in, in managing social interactions, it turns out. The other bit, the bits that are critical along the temporal lobe here, just sort of behind the ear, as it were, inside the skull from the ear. And it's the sort of circuitry between these two that makes up this kind of uh, social cognition circuit that in turn determines the number of friends you have. And what this allows you to do, this circuit seems to allow you to do, is to understand how other people are thinking, the state of their minds, as it were. And it's the number of individuals whose minds you can handle in this kind of way that set, seems to set the limit on the total number of friends you have. So I'm sorry to have to tell you, um, you know, well, there is an interesting question as to whether that bit of the brain, or any bit of the brain, can sort of expand or contract as a result of practice during childhood in particular. And that's quite likely. I mean, we, the brain is much more plastic than we thought. But I'm really sorry to have to tell most of you here that if you're now in your early 20s, it's too late to change. You're stuck with the friends that you've got. <laughs> <coughs> Why is time important in, in the context of friendships? Uh, if, if you like to think of how you organize your social life, it has two key components. There's that cognitive component, just sort of trying to keep track of the nature of your relationship with other individuals. But time plays a very important component in that process because it's investing time in your relationships that makes them a relationship, so the strength of that relationship, the sense of emotional closeness, is determined by how much time you invest uh, in your individual friendships. And just to illustrate uh, how important this is, your social world really consists of a series of sort of circles um, which scale very tightly with each other. So these circles are at sort of, uh, these are the number of friends you have, as it were, at 5, 15, 50, and out to the 150. Uh, and as you come in, you're getting obviously a smaller number of friends, but the quality of that relationship is much more intense. So that inner circle of five best friends you have actually account for something in the order of about half of your total social time. About three quarters of your total social time is devoted to those inner two layers, the sort of five and 15 layers, as it were. Uh, they're the ones that are really important to you. They provide you with emotional support and, and so on. But it's the if you don't invest time in those relationships, the quality of those relationships will decay. And here's a rather nice example. We were looking at how many people, uh, the size of that inner circle of five. Uh, and so we got a whole bunch of people to, to, to tell us this is not defined in terms of the number, it's defined in terms of the people you feel you would go to in moments of deep emotional or financial crisis, the ones who would really help you out, as it were. And people consistently come up with about five as the average. There's a lot of variation around that, but five is the average. We also asked people, were you in, are you in a, an, an active romantic relationship at the moment? And some of them said no, and that's those days, and some of them said yes. And the people who said yes only had four close friends in that category. <laughs> so the second bad news of today is romance is expensive. And it's not just the diamond rings, it's time. All your time is committed, you, you, that relationship is so time consuming, you, you can't uh, afford to spend time with other people. If you think about what this implies is, forming a romantic relationship costs you a friendship, right? Because that, ex, that person who should have been in here, the fifth person, has now bumped down into the next layer. And believe me, if you don't, and that means you won't see them so often, if you don't see your friends so often, they ain't going to be your friends. They're very unforgiving. So how, and just to illustrate this effect, this is what happens when you need to keep the strength of relationships up. So these are data on the change in emotional closeness uh, to all your friends, as opposed to family, uh, over an 18-month period as a function of whether you spent less time 
uh, in conversation with them about the same uh, across that period, or during the course of that time, you increase the amount of conversation time. And, you'll know, and these are split for uh, the blokes and the girls. So the blokes are, are blue, the green are the girls. And you'll notice that if you spend less time talking to them, the emotional closeness just plummets away. It happens very, very quickly, within about six months. But if, certainly for girls, if girls keep conversation up and talk to each other a lot, it helps prevent the decay on relationships. These are people who've moved away from home, so they can't physically go and see them, but so easily, I have to make a big effort to go, but they can phone them and so on. But I draw your attention to the boys. Apparently, talking does not improve boys' relationships. <laughs> there's, a, <laughs> there's a slightly more subtle point to this. We also asked them, uh, well, you know, tell us all the things you've done with these people. You know, been shopping with them, gone to parties, helped them move house, gone on holiday with them, whole long list. And <clears throat> when we did the same analysis, look what happened. It's the reverse. What prevents boys' relationships decaying is doing stuff together. Apparently, doing stuff more, doing stuff together for girls has a negative effect on them. <laughs> <laughs> so this. <laughs> This is my pitch for why the telephone in particular, uh, digital media in general, the telephone in particular, and things like Facebook especially so, which are highly female dominated, relatively speaking, two thirds of time on, on, on Facebook is, is by women, and why women's phone call conversations last for an hour on average. <laughs> it's just perfectly designed. The technology is perfectly designed for the way females network and manage the women network and manage their social relationships. But I also would explain to you, this explains why boys' phone calls only last 7.3 seconds on average. <laughs> and that's because all they have to do is to say, I'll see you down the pub at seven. <laughs> so how good is the, is the digital world? We, we, did a study last year which looked at how satisfied you felt with uh, the interactions you had with your five closest friends by di through different media. This is sort of real life, everyday stuff, so uh, it wasn't sort of constructed in a lab, as it were. Face to face, by Skype, phone calls, instant messaging, texting, email, and, and social networking sites. And you can see that face to face and Skype are way better, and it's because you have a sense of co presence there. You're in the same room together as you are in a face to face interaction. But also what's important for sure is the immediacy of the response you get. Right? You can see the smile breaking on the face as you start to tell a joke. Jokes are notoriously flat if you send them on email. Things you'd fall about, uh, really bad jokes you'd fall about laughing over in the pub, and not just because you've had too much to drink, but on email just you kind of go, oh, why did you bother? And this comes out of these data very nicely. If you also, also ask, as we did, was the laughter in that, uh, um, uh, convers that uh, conversation, uh, whether it was real laughter or kind of virtual laughter in the sense of emoticons, it seems that the level of satisfaction in it, after an interaction in which laughter in some form occurred is much, much higher than an interaction with the same person when laughter doesn't occur. And the reason laughter is so important in this context, and it seems to be one of the key drivers for, for, for creating relationship quality, and I think that's why in Lonely Hearts ad you see GSOH so often, good sense of humor. It's really important in kind of servicing our relationships, but here's why. What laughter does is trigger the release of endorphins, and endorphins are the brain's own painkillers, basically. They give you a very slight opiate high. And we've tried to look at this by giving a bunch of people um, uh, 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 comedy videos to watch, uh, uh, Michael McIntyre, various stand-up comedians, and we compared them with a bunch of people who watched boring videos, mostly <laughs> golf, golfing instruction. <laughs> <clears throat> and we measured endorphin production through pain threshold like this. The, if endorphins are produced, pain thresholds will go up, so you'll see an increase in pain threshold. You can stand more pain after laughing, and sure enough, just look at the difference, it's, it's really clear cut. Th this one I really like because we did it live at the Edinburgh Fringe. This was a stand-up comedy group, the audience watching stand-up comedy. This was uh, audiences watching playlets at the Edinburgh Fringe. And you see the same effect there. 
Laughter makes the world go round. Thank you very much.